David Troy, host and co-curator of TEDx Mid-Atlantic in Washington, D.C. Today we're here featuring an exclusive preview of the documentary film Selling Lies and a conversation with director Leslie Iwerks. Leslie is an Academy Award nominated filmmaker who is perhaps best known for her acclaimed Disney Plus documentary series The Imagineering Story, which tells the 65-year history of the artists and engineers who created Disney's theme parks. Her firm, iWorks & Company, has worked on many other documentary projects, including a trilogy about the Canadian oil sands. And she also holds a special place in Disney history as her grandfather of iWorks created Mickey Mouse with Walt Disney. Welcome, Leslie. We're so glad you could be here with us today. Thank you, David. Thrilled to be here. So, Leslie, several of your films uh, seem to have kind of an entrepreneurial and business kind of aspect to them. I'm wondering maybe if you could tell us a little bit more about um, this particular story and how, you know, that aspect of, of it spoke to you as you were considering what projects to take next. Sure. So, um, you know, for the last 15, 20 years, I've been doing documentaries of all different sizes and ilts, shapes and forms, you know, lengths, etc., um, I've traveled all over the world to all seven continents and have tell, told stories that, about all sorts of different subjects. But um, one of the threads that run through them is, is entrepreneurship in some way, shape, or form. Um, it could be really great story of entrepreneurship. It could be not so great story of entrepreneurship. And whether it be from, you know, the founding of Pixar to the Imagineering story and building theme parks around the world to Citizen Hearst about William Randolph Hearst and, you know, the media empire that he built over 125 years and plus going. And so those stories um, have, have been very interesting to me um, as to what makes people tick and what makes people, um, you know, take on a specific industry and then try to find the cracks in it and try to find the opportunities in it, right? And so I think that's what drove me to the story about the fake news coming out of Macedonia because it was tying in young people who needed to find a way to make a living in an impoverished country, um, plus Facebook and Facebook having its own imperfections and cracks and the two of them coming together, one, these teenagers and, and the people who taught them how to do this were finding the ways to infiltrate Facebook and literally manipulate million people by what they were reading. Um, and so it was almost like this perfect storm of, 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 you know, I don't know, desperation meets ingenuity <laughs> and finding opportunity, but not for the better good, not for the greater good. Um, you know, because mor morally, you, you, most anybody will argue that spreading fake news is absolutely immoral and wrong. Um, but everyone has their own agenda, and so they find a way to validate it. And so all of these, this whole mashup of thoughts and um, actions and morality and business and entrepreneurship all sort of crash together for me to say, let me, let me just go to Macedonia and see if I can dig into this a little deeper. And um, we've got some questions from our audience, but first I wanted to ask you, what uh, drew you to want to tell this particular story? How did you get involved with these particular characters? Well, it was uh, late 2016, um, shortly after the election, when I was reading about these teenagers in Macedonia who were um, infiltrating Facebook, reading all these fake sites that were getting um, a lot of traction around the United States. and. Um, to such, a, to such an extent that the FBI and the CIA were uh, involved and, um, and the, the, uh, the Hillary camp, um, the Trump camp, you know, and it was, it was pretty big news. And to think that these teenagers could actually make a difference was seemed really odd to me. Um, and so, you know, I, I got up one morning, I read this article in Wired Magazine and I thought this could be an interesting story to go try to get to the bottom of. And so got up and called my DP and said, would you be interested in going to shoot this with me? He's from Bosnia. He was going to be over there anyway um, for the summer. So, I, so we agreed that I would fly out to Macedonia and start filming. So this film, uh, you know, primarily seems to be focusing on people that are creating uh, misinformation um, as opposed to disinformation, you know, information that's sort of... Uh, incorrect without necessarily need, meaning to fulfill some sort of particular agenda or cause harm, but it kind of evolved more in that direction over time, um, similar to what we've seen with some state, um, you know, sponsors. How do you, how would you sort of characterize how that uh, transitioned over time? 
Sure. So, you know, I think everybody has an agenda, um, depending on what level of um, harm you're trying to do when it comes to fake news. And I think in the case of these teenagers, they found a way to make a quick buck. And when I talk, when I say quick buck, that was, you know, some, some to the tune of $100,000 a month, um, you know, when their normal take home is, you know, maybe 500 a month or 800 a month uh, in Macedonia. And this was a lot of money that was getting made. And so, you know, for them, I think it was, let's find stories that are already being created in different parts of the US and even in Macedonia, but they were taking, cutting and pasting um, biased or, or outright false news um, from different websites, such as Fox or Breitbart or, you know, different ones, and then manipulating those headlines to make them very shocking. Uh, so that the American viewer would 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 find them like you know horror or shocking. Hillary Clinton, you know, does this or the Pope does this or what have you, and they just found that the more shocking the headline, the more clickbait you would get, right? Um, but I think that over time, um, you know, th obviously they got found out by um, you know a number of journalists who were who were onto them looking up their IP addresses from the United States and found that all these kids in Macedonia were creating all this stuff. Um, and then over time, I think that largely got shut down because Facebook started to uh, put in the, uh, you know, the walls against the fissures, so to speak, that these kids were getting into. They were uh, connecting the dots and seeing how they were being able to infiltrate. Um, but but as far as Trache Arsov, who was in the in the film as well, I think his his whole motivation really was was propaganda in that he really did believe that Trump was the better president for the United States and was he had an agenda, um, and his agenda was was to create as much false information about Hillary Clinton, about Obama, um, what they did wrong, what they what they didn't do, you know, at all, and and uh, try to get as much clickbait as possible um, to sway that election. And Trache had more followers, um, you know, through his social media sites than all of the media in Macedonia combined. Wow. Yeah, that really says something. And I think that points to a kind of multi-layered evolution where, you know, you sort of start out with sort of one kind of, uh, you know, strategy, and then that you realize that like, okay, well, there's also a demand for uh, you know, these kinds of sensational headlines that get a lot of activity and spread on social. And then also, if you want to fold in, you know, either your own personal agenda or other state sponsored agendas that may come into the mix. I mean, it all kind of combines to form this evolutionary, uh, you know, effect that, that, you know, later on, uh, you know, has a, has a huge outcome in terms of how people perceive things. I just, I just feel like the onus is on us to really, to, to try and stop to stop believing what what we read in every way, shape, or form, and and also look. People have asked, well, how do I how do I change it myself? How do I impact this? And I think you have to look at the headline, you have to look at the the the, the publisher, and you have to also look at the bottom of every site because oftentimes they they will say this is you know a fake news site, or sometimes they will actually have that disclaimer, um, but not often. And so again, it's, it's looking at propaganda, hoax, or outright bias and seeing how that, that, that sort of mix that recipe is and seeing how much of it is true and how, of it, how much of it is false. Yeah. And as you point out, it's a big systems problem. You know, there's parts of this that are coming from all different sides. Facebook has its own motivations. You know, the other platforms are motivated certain ways. We've got nation states, we've got people playing for profit. We have people, you know, trying to advance their own confirmation bias and build groups and build political support. So it's, it's a very complicated, um, you know, series of problems. Um, one question that we got here was about um, the idea of uh, censorship and, you know, how do you solve this problem? And this is obviously a big ongoing debate. Um, but, uh, you know, when, if a platform takes down content, you know, people will say colloquially that that's censorship, even though, you know, the technical definition of censorship is when the government uh, prevents the publication of certain kinds of content. Um, you know, there's been a big discussion about Section 230 and, you know, platforms responsibilities with regards to content. Well, what's your take on kind of like where that sits and, and what ought to be a solution from, from the standpoint of platforms, you know, reacting to this kind of content? 
I personally believe that Facebook and Twitter and Instagram need to be doing what they're doing even more, which is to curtail obvious fake news and damaging, damaging stories to others. Um, I know a lot of people that do believe that that censorship, obviously Infowars thinks that censorship, that they feel that they can spew out complete false narratives and say, if you take that down, that's that censorship. However, you know, I suppose you could liken it to the airlines. Is it is it okay to just get on an airline and shoot it down? Um, <laughs> or do you need regulations in place in order not to do that? Do you need security lines and security x-ray machines to make sure that something like that doesn't happen? And a lot of, you know, people I've spoken to have kind of likened it to that, which is it's this, this is not a weapon. These, these publishing sites should not be a, a, a weapon to create negative, um, false leading narratives. And I just firmly believe that. And otherwise our, our society is going to continue to get more chaotic and more, more out of control if we do not call this back. So uh, Al asks uh, about Congress and, um, you know, what kinds of things that Congress uh, might be able to do to, um, you know, pass legislation that would have some effects in this area. Is that something that you've given any real, you know, serious thought to? Well, yeah, I mean, it's obviously there's been a lot of test testifying with Zuckerberg and others on um, Capitol Hill to try to rein in these social media platforms and have them take more responsibility. And I, I think I do believe it's important for Congress to keep at it and to keep fighting on behalf of the people of this country to not get influenced by so much negative, negative fake news and uh, false leading information. And so I think it's going to be an ongoing not only debate, but a mission um, or a call to action for this government or, you know, I, I, I don't know how it's going to be under Trump, but um, for us to sort of try to right the ship, so to speak. Um, so uh, one person asks, um, you know, it seems the fake news is making more money than real news. And, you know, is it still possible to make money now today, you know, with this kind of uh, just sort of raw, uh, you know, fake stories? Or do you think that that's largely been uh, kind of curbed at this point? Well, you can look at uh, Macedonia. Those kids are not making money anymore doing this. So right. it's definitely cracking down. There's the walls are going up against the ability to do this and sort of a um, layman way that the, that those kids were able to do it. Obviously, Facebook made a lot of mistakes early on and didn't see it coming. And uh, they were able to get through the fissures and do this. Um, unfortunately, fake news spreads fast, like a fast wildfire, but putting that fire out is very slow. And so it's, it, that's the problem. And it takes a while to catch it. But, you know, there is inspiration on the horizon. I mean, there's a lot of people working hard behind the scenes, private sector, creating, um, you know, disinformation blocks and, and technology that can, that can flag fake news, that can flag deep fakes, that can flag, um, you know, um, all sorts of, all sorts of stories and, and foreign in entities that are trying to encroach upon our election and, and our, our country's narrative. So I do think it's taken time, just like finding a vaccine <laughs> for COVID is, but it's, it's in the works. Um, and I've been reading a lot about different entities that are actually doing great things to try to help the situation. Yeah, what I've heard from, you know, listening to Facebook executives and people at Twitter and whatnot is that they're on the lookout for what they call coordinated into inauthentic behavior, where it isn't so much about what people say, it's more about are they, you know, using lots of different accounts and trying to shape a certain kind of narrative and affect people and that sort of thing. And are they misrepresenting themselves, you know, um, are, and I think what that ultimately boils down to is are they acting in bad faith and, you uh, you know, for people that seem to be bad faith actors, that's where they're doing a lot of the takedowns. And so I think, you know, the the overall goal needs to be as to make that kind of activity as expensive as possible, so that the return on investment is is very low, um, as where, right. you know, like the ROI five years ago was extremely high. Um, so we have two people that ask um, about future projects that you're maybe working on now or things that you can talk about that might be uh, things that we could look for coming from iWorks and company. Ah, oh, thank you. Well, um, let me think what I can actually share. <laughs> um, I'm working on about three series right now in development um, and uh, about three feature films and some narrative series as well. So, so live action narrative projects and um, also a book. So 
no uh, lack of, of uh, projects, I should say. And are you working on anything else kind of in this uh, sort of information, you know, fake news space or this was kind of just a, a one off or? Well, the, the, the world of journalism or the state of journalism is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. I'm really interested in, I don't know, stories that about journalists who are, in my opinion, um, not fake news writers, but, but the, the people that are really trying to tell the truth and really trying to uphold the truth. Um, we really need to, to have respect for people trying to get the truth out. And it, as we see in the film, it's definitely harder and harder as major news networks are lacking in funding or funding starts to decline. Um, and the access to social media pages and platforms are continuing to increase. It's just easier to continue to create fake news. So I think fighting against that tide is the hardest the hardest challenge I think going forward, but I'm really interested in stories about journalists to, to answer your question and um, mm -hmm. looking always looking for great stories in that vein to tell. So yeah, for those of us that have uh, just seen the film, um, how can people uh, see this again? How can they share it with their friends and family? October 9th, the film is getting released on Amazon, I Apple iTunes and Vimeo On Demand and Google Play. And it will also be releasing in virtual cinema um, with theaters around the country in order to help the local theaters uh, you know, stay sustained, but also allow our film to get screened in, in different cities. So we're excited about that. And this is all in conjunction with Shorts TV. Awesome, terrific. So people can learn more at sellinglies.doc.com. That's sellinglies and the doc.com. Thanks so much for joining us, Leslie. We really appreciate your being here. Thank you. All right, talk soon. Thank you.